Dear colleagues, in partnership with NDT, Nephrology Dialysis Transplantation, the official journal of the European Renal Association, Marcus at Home welcomes Dr. Gemma Maria Fernandez Juarez and Dr. Fernando Caravaca Fontan in Madrid, Spain, with whom we would like to discuss the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with glomerular nephritis, focusing upon their very large cohort study that has recently been accepted for publication in NDT. As announced a few weeks ago by NDT's editor-in-chief, Hans-Joachim Anders, Andreas Kronbichler and I are invited to pick one paper from NDT each month, which we consider to be of particular interest both to nephrologists and to internists. And since we are positive that the question if and how to use SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with GN is highly topical, we chose Dr. Fernandez Juarez and Dr. Caravaca Fontan's paper for this month's NDT Marcus at Home special. So dear Gemma, dear Fernando, we are very happy to host you tonight. Thank you. Dr. Gemma Fernandez Juarez is nephrologist, head of department of nephrology at the Hospital La Paz in Madrid, Spain, and coordinator of master in glomerular diseases. Dr. Fernando Caravaca Fontan is nephrologist at Hospital Universitario Dorothea de Octubre, also in Madrid, Spain. So we would suggest that we start our talk by giving you the opportunity to show the background of your study and the major results. Well, good afternoon. Um, so uh, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to, to be here today. So it's uh, such a great opportunity to show the results of, of this study and to be able to discuss about the topic uh, later after this brief presentation. So um, over the last year, several landmark studies have consistently showed that SGLT2 inhibitors are associated with improved cardiovascular outcomes to even reduce hospitalization rates and mortality in addition to nephroprotection. Uh, these agents have a hemodynamic effect leading to a decrease in tracheal pressure and have been associated with reductions in albuminuria and oxygen demand by the kidneys. And as you all know, proteinuria is an important marker for predicting the risk of kidney disease progression. And uh, an early change in albuminuria has been accepted as a valid surrogate endpoint for kidney disease progression in several clinical trials, and particularly those uh, uh, related to glomerular diseases. Blood pressure control and proteinuria lowering using the renin angiotensin system blockade represents the cornerstone of treatment to halt progression. However, in a wide variety of glomerular and systemic diseases with glomerular involvement, significant residual proteinuria and albuminuria especially may persist despite target immunosuppressive therapy and maximum tolerated uh, doses of RAS blockade. Uh, in this regard, several landmark studies such as DAPA CKD and the EMPA kidney have provided rationale for the use of SGLT2 inhibitors, not only in diabetic patients, but also in those with diabetic nephropathy in order to control uh, this uh, degree of uh, albuminuria. For instance, in a sub-analysis of the DAPA CKD trial, including patients uh, with IgA nephropathy uh, that were treated with dapagliflozin, uh, this drug reduced albuminuria by 26% relative to placebo and also led to a slower EGFR decline, uh, as you can see uh, in this slide. In another pre-specified analysis of the ZAPA CKD trial uh, in patients with FSGS, dapagliflozin reduced the rate of chronic GFR decline compared to placebo, although this difference did not reach statistical significance. However, the effects of SGLT2 inhibitor dapagliflozin on proteinuria in uh, non-diabetic patients with chronic kidney disease uh, uh, in the Diamond study, uh, so the results failed to show a significant proteinuria reduction in patients uh, who had this chronic kidney disease with uh, diabetes and were treated with dapagliflozin over a six-week treatment period, but found an acute and reversible EGFR decline. And so based on these different results, SGLT2 inhibitors have recently begun to be used in glomerular and systemic diseases with glomerular involvement uh, in clinical practice for the treatment of uh, proteinuria. However, the information in real world clinical settings is scarce. And moreover, uh, their use in several other glomerular and systemic diseases and the main predictors of the anti-proteinuria uh, response 
have uh, scarcely been reported. And therefore, the aim of this study was uh, to analyze the antiprenuric effect of SGLT2 inhibitors in combination with brass blockade in a large international multicentric cohort of patients uh, uh, with glomerular diseases and uh, persistent residual proteinuria. So <clears throat> we were able to collect <clears throat> the experience from different centers, uh, this real world data, uh, uh, and uh, this was, uh, uh, so we had the opportunity to publish this manuscript, uh, as you said, in NDT. And so this was a retrospective observational uh, international cohort study, uh, which comprised patients from Spain, Uruguay, Chile, Greece, Germany, and United Kingdom. And uh, we included adult patients with biopsy proven glomerular diseases. And the main outcome was the percentage reduction in 24 hour proteinuria from SGLT2 inhibitor initiation to three, six, nine, and 12 months. And the secondary outcomes included a percentage change in EGFR, proteinuria reduction by type of kidney disease, and reduction of proteinuria of uh, a, a, at least 30% uh, from SGLT2 inhibitor initiation. So the study consisted of uh, 493 patients uh, with a median age of 55 years and 157, 32% were females. Uh, as I said before, all patients were on RAS blockade at baseline, mainly uh, ARPs, and 188 patients were on diuretics. 56 uh, patients had a TICI uh, type or light diuretic, 69 patients had loop diuretics, 40 uh, had aldosterone antagonists, and uh, 23 cases uh, had a combination of different diuretics. And as you can see in the table on the right-hand side of the slide, almost 40% of them corresponded to IgA nephropathy, 18% had membranous nephropathy, 18% had also a primary or secondary FSGS, although a bunch of other glomerular and systemic diseases were included, um, as you can see, including ankyovasculitis, lupus nephritis, or even C3G, among other uh, rare causes. So in this slide, the longitudinal, uh, longitudinal trajectories of uh, the logarithmic transform EGFR, serum albumin, and proteinuria are presented, and the shaded area uh, uh, of each of these uh, graphs corresponded to the six months prior to the initiation of uh, SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, so overall, uh, the geometric mean percentage change of proteinuria after SGLT2 inhibitor initiation was minus 35% at three months, minus 41% at six months, minus 45% at nine months, and minus 48% at 12 months, whereas the percentage change in EGFR was lower, as you can see in the slide. In this slide, uh, uh, I showed the adjusted mean percentage change of EGFR and proteinuria um, by type of kidney disease. As you can see, uh, the red, um, the red uh, graph correspond to EGFR and proteinuria, and uh, we combine um, for when when the the number of cases were uh, uh, small. We combine, for instance, here IgA nephropathy and IgA vasculitis, and here you can see minimal changes in FSGS, and uh, for other. Uh, uh, rare causes, we combine them uh, in order to analyze them together. So as you can see, results were pretty much consistent, uh, irrespective of, of the underlying kidney disease etiology, although for some kidney disease, as you can see, the confidence intervals uh, were wider, and probably because of the lower number of cases uh, over follow-up. Interestingly, by multivariable model, serum albumin uh, SGLT2 uh, inhibitor onset emerge as a predictor of 30% uh, proteinuria reduction, meaning that those patients with low serum albumin at onset had lower probability of achieving this outcome of 30% uh, proteinuria reduction. In addition, we found a correlation between the body mass index and the percentage of proteinuria reduction so that obese patients uh, had higher chances of reaching a proteinuria reduction as you can see uh, in this graph. This is the body mass index and the percentage proteinuria change over follow-up. And uh, uh, finally, for those who had a proteinuria reduction of 30%, uh, 
uh, over follow-up, they had a, a lower EGFR decline over time, as you can see in the right hand side of, uh, of the slide. And so uh, to conclude uh, in our study, we found that uh, the use of SGLT2 inhibitor was associated with a significant reduction of proteinuria. This percentage change was higher in those patients with higher body mass index. A higher serum albumin at uh, SGLT2 inhibitor onset was associated with a higher probability of achieving this outcome of 30% uh, proteinuria reduction. And those patients who had uh, who achieved this 30% proteinuria reduction had a slower EGFR uh, decline over time. And therefore, taken together, uh, our data somehow suggests that in clinical, the clinical profile of patients uh, with glomerular and systemic diseases, with uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, who have persistent residual proteinuria, who might benefit the most uh, with SGLT2 inhibitors, would be those who have a serum albumin above 3.5 gram per deciliter, and those who uh, with higher body mass uh, index, likely uh, reflecting the importance of hypofiltration uh, as a central antiproteinuric mechanism uh, in this, uh, of these drugs. However, uh, while our studies, uh, we should acknowledge uh, important limitations uh, in our study, and therefore uh, we, have, we will have to wait for other uh, further sub-analysis uh, uh, on the trials that have already been done, and particularly the, the MPA kidney and the sub-analysis performed for, for these patients with glomerular disease. And this is uh, pretty much it. And uh, after this, I will be very happy to uh, discuss with you the different details on this study. Well, thank you very much for this uh, great overview and a nice presentation. So the first thing, of course, coming to my mind is um, how did patients respond when they were on immunosuppression? How many patients were on immunosuppression? And did you see more safety signals in these individuals? Yeah, so patients were uh, uh, already on immunosuppression, had, had received this target therapy for, the, for their underlying disease. And uh, uh, the physician, the treating physician, considered that uh, these patients would benefit in terms of uh, proteinuria reduction, and therefore, combined with uh, this RAS blockade, they uh, uh, they were prescribed these these agents. And uh, just a few uh, percentage of these patients were on maintenance immunosuppression, and particularly those uh, who had systemic diseases like lupus nephritis, they had a, a, some degree of maintenance uh, immunosuppression. But overall, uh, patients uh, were had already been treated for their underlying condition. And uh, th this treatment was used mainly for their anti uh, or trying to find this anti effect. Do you have any explanation why those with a normal serum albumin actually responded better to the therapy or had a, a more pronounced effect. That would argue a bit about, you know, secondary forms then or burned out autoimmunity and secondary proteinuria to do chronic yeah, so, damage like that. Yeah, that's it. That's uh, that's our high, higher hypothesis that, um, so if you uh, use an SGLT2 inhibitor in a patient with an, an active nephrotic syndrome, those who have... Uh, uh, this uh, serum albumin below uh, 3.5, the chances that these patients would uh, respond in terms of uh, having a, an antiproteinuria response would be lower. And this is pretty much consistent um, uh, with what we uh, have uh, already learned from a RAS blockade. For instance, if you use, uh, if you apply a RAS blockade in a patient with an overt nephrotic syndrome, the, the chances that you get an antiproteinuria response is, is very low. And therefore, um, uh, so the, the main uh, uh, treatment that these patients with an active uh, uh, proteinuric disease uh, should be based on the underlying cause. And therefore, um, the use of immunosuppression would be the first step. And once the patient has uh, reached any degree of remission of the underlying disease, um, we should focus on this um, uh, residual proteinuria um, that, uh, as you all know, uh, many of these cases, this degree of residual proteinuria may be due to also 
other uh, comorbidities, and particularly those who have um, uh, this high body mass index are much more prone to have uh, residual proteinuria despite having uh, a, uh, somehow an immunological remission of, of the underlying disease. And this is what we found that uh, this agent combined with uh, the conventional RAS blockade, uh, well, this uh, treatment overall was well tolerated and uh, uh, helped to reduce proteinuria uh, in, a significant, in a significant way. So in those patients with, you know, antibodies relevant to the disease, such as membranous or also lupus nephritis, do you have any information about double-stranded DNA or phospholipase A2 receptor antibodies? Do you know that? Well, so we did not collect uh, these uh, different parameters, but uh, um, because, well, actually, we would like to focus actually on, on the, the protein area. But mm -hmm. uh, based on uh, what uh, the different uh, colleagues, uh, the collaborators uh, and the, the inclusion criteria, these patients were already in any degree of uh, remission. And the main reason for treatment uh, of these, these agents was, uh, uh, as I said, trying to, to uh, find this antiperturinary response. Yeah, that was a bit of a stupid question, but I came across a study in the Annals of the Rheumatic Diseases um, where a Chinese group um, applied empagliflozin to a lupus nephritis mouse model, and they even found a reduction in double-stranded DNA once you give SGLT2 inhibition. So I found that very interesting, but it's I don't know if we can believe that um, you know these therapies also exert some form of immunosuppressive um efficacy so that would be quite interesting also to explore to see you know if patients with membranes and you have a lot of them actually have a lowering of of phospholipase a2 receptor um, yeah, yeah well, if they are uh, you know in my case uh, i'm a little bit more ex skeptic in this uh, uh, degree you know uh, uh, once a new agent comes to market uh, you know there comes this different uh, controversial subanalysis uh, so I don't know uh, to what degree uh, these uh, effects could be applied more to, you know, uh, could there be some underlying immunological uh, effects? It has also been speculated on uh, uh, some effects on complement. And uh, so what we know is that these agents are uh, very effective uh, from a hemodynamic uh, uh, standpoint and also are associated with uh, uh, reductions in cardiovascular uh, um, outcomes. And therefore, I mean, uh, the use of, of these agents are uh, in, in, in this population, uh, they are uh, uh, more than justified. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, probably future studies should better uh, uh, dissect these potential uh, properties beyond uh, these hemodynamic effects. Uh, it is uh, very interesting, that possibility, but in my case, I feel a little bit more skeptic. I don't know. But maybe uh, we should be uh, cautious with us because if you use this kind of drugs in patients with severe nephrotic syndrome, maybe uh, their hemodynamic situation will, uh, can get worse. So, of course, it's an interesting uh, topic uh, that uh, maybe could be studied in the future if the if this drug can affect or or have an immunology an immunolo immunological uh, effect. Uh, personally, I doubt about that, but uh, in this moment, I think that uh, we should be cautious. And uh, maybe when the patient they have a, a huge nephrotic syndrome, maybe uh, then uh, the patient uh, is needing a diuretic uh, to add and, uh, and this kind of drugs 
uh, can be dangerous because can be induced uh, functional acne. So maybe uh, this kind of drug should be useful uh, with this uh, uh, um, chronic proteinuria, but in active uh, immunological proteinuria, uh, I think uh, it should be um, uh, uh, or, or should be avoid uh, this kind of drugs. So like a patient who comes to your hospital with minimal change disease, large proteinuria, low plasma albumin, in such a patient, you would not go for an SGLT2 inhibitor, I guess. Maybe it's one of the uh, of the uh, best um, uh, conclusion of this study. In patients with, uh, with serum albumin reduced, uh, the potential effect of this kind of drugs is uh, is worse. So maybe because um, in this situation, the, the main uh, mechanism is the immunological mechanism. So in this case, uh, you should uh, uh, put all your uh, um, effort in uh, the immunological, immunology, immunolo immunological response. So, of course, these kind of drugs uh, should be used later with uh, the uh, hemodynamic or the hyperfiltration uh, was the main uh, mechanism of damage on the, on the kidney. And then also the period of kidney disease may be quite short in these patients who are expected to get normal uh, kidney function and no proteinuria after a couple of weeks on steroids. So I guess also for this reason, you would not really need nephro protection with SGLT2 inhibitors. And this has actually just been suggested also by another NDT paper in a Eurocam and ERBP working group statement, who clearly state that we should actually go with SGLT2 inhibitors to all patients with a single exception, those with GM who are expected to get prompt remission with immunosuppression. I guess that's the second argument not to give SGLT2 inhibitors in these few patients. But if you achieve complete remission with immunological response at the proteinuria, is almost zero. Maybe the the kind of drug is not uh, indicated, but uh, this uh, scenario is very uh, very um, uh, is not uh, doesn't exist. But uh, after an a flare or after uh, an active immunological damage, uh, after that a, a residual proteinuria occur. So uh, maybe this is the time to, to introduce this kind of drugs. Uh, after uh, a flare, after uh, um, an acute uh, damage uh, from immunological uh, um, cause, um, this kind of drug can be uh, used, but not during, or, or not at least during uh, the um, open uh, nephrotic syndrome. Yeah, so in this regard, I would like to point out that, yeah, I agree that it is necessary to, to individualize based on the, the underlying disease and the curse of the disease. And also it is important to, to uh, look, uh, look on the trends, uh, both, for instance, uh, uh, you were talking on minimal change disease. Of course, if the trends are going, I mean, the trends to proteinuria uh, are going down, it makes no sense at all to add uh, these uh, these agents, and the same applies to, for instance, uh, membranous nephropathy, in which you have achieved an immunological response, and the trends in proteinuria are going down. So there's no uh, makes no sense to add SGLT2 inhibitor for these patients that are already on RAS blockade, unless these proteinuria is persistent. And in this regard, and based on the the critics of uh, of the reviewers. Uh, so we also collected what happened the six months before the three or six months before the initiation of SGLT2 inhibitors and whether there was already a trend in the in the EGFR or proteinuria. Uh, and therefore, if these trends were actually the main responsible for the response uh, for the, 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 the change in proteinuria from the SGLT2 initiation. And what we found was that there were 
no significant changes in uh, proteinuria before the SGLT2 inhibitor or the EGFR, and therefore uh, this uh, effect on proteinuria were um, uh, uh, were uh, attributed uh, could be attributed to to SGLT2 inhibitor. This is a very, very good point you're making here. I think people need to read empakitinib in greater detail because it clearly shows when you have no albuminuria, uh, SGLT2 inhibition is at least not nephroprotective anymore because the odds ratio, hazard ratio was 1-0. So that's an important point. And I think for minimal change disease where you have to switch, most of the patients are achieving complete remission easily. I don't think that it makes sense to add any nephroprotection, not, not even um, ACE inhibition, because these patients will have continuous flares, but not necessarily proteinuria during the follow-up. Anyway, so another disease I was um, struck by when reading the, the details of the trials is FSGS. You mentioned that, Fernando. There has been this NDD sub-analysis. And, you know, there have been a lot of publications showing that SGLT2 inhibition can have antifibrotic effects. And you would expect from all the GNs we are actually summarizing here or treating that FSGS has one of the most or striking benefits, but in comparison to IgA nephropathy, it didn't seem to be like that. Do you have any explanation for that? I mean, I know it's a difficult question, but... It's kind of really unsurprising to me and really um, unexplained so far. Yeah, so, uh, well, FSGS is uh, a big challenge from a nephrologist's perspective and uh, particularly on the diagnosis. So the main problem, in my opinion, is that we are considering that as a single disease. And probably uh, because of that, we are not able to better stratify uh, the potential benefits of some agents uh, in those uh, types of FSGS that would uh, uh, reasonably um, um, benefit from, from these agents. For instance, on primary FSGS, um, uh, I mean, me in my case, you know, being frustrated by the, the difficulties in achieving any degree of response to a corticosteroid resistant disease, I also applied this just to see, you know, if uh, I was able uh, to at least reduce proteinuria, but uh, the patient did not respond at all. So, you know, uh, I don't know if, uh, as I said before, there could be some potential, uh, other potential benefits of these agents in terms of reduction of, uh, as you said, the fibrosis, other immunological effects, uh, but the main problem uh, in primary FSGS uh, cannot be a result. Uh, however, um, it is very interesting and uh, that those patients who have secondary forms of FSGS, the results uh, of this experience is, is very good. And uh, uh, yeah, so the, the main problem, in my opinion, uh, is that, um, and, and the reason why uh, there are still a lot of controversies on, on these agents, is the, the, the problem of uh, the definitions of FSDS. And it has also been controversial uh, with uh, these recent studies that uh, have been published on Sparsenta and on other, other agents, uh, considering FSDS as a single disease uh, instead of uh, a pattern of kidney disease. Yes, but maybe uh, uh, we are moving in a hypothetical uh, uh, scenario uh, because uh, we don't know how to measure uh, the fibrosis unless we have a renal biopsy. But uh, we, uh, uh, so far we know that uh, maybe the feedback glomerulotubulo uh, exists and maybe if you reduce uh, the hyperfiltration, maybe you can reduce uh, the new uh, um, fibrosis in the tubular interstitial uh, area. But to but moving on, the next step that uh, is that this kind of drugs can reduce uh, the, the the fibrosis or can reduce the tubular interstitial damage. I think is a very big step. And I don't know if the if the current um, evidence uh, do 
input that we can affi affirm this kind of, of uh, statement. So um, in this aspect, I will be, uh, um, I'm not sure that uh, the, this kind of drug can reduce uh, the fibrosis unless uh, they can do it uh, reducing hyperfiltration and reducing the feedback glomerular tubular interstitial damage, but not uh, maybe directly in the tubular interstitial damage. And you had lots of histological analysis in your paper, which I like very much. And you found that actually independent of the degree of chronic changes, there was a response in proteinuria. So if I got it right, there have been no histological landmarks which suggested against using the SGLT2 inhibitor. Yeah, so we analyze uh, uh, the degree of chronicity in kidney biopsies because uh, so our hypothesis was that those patients had had uh, hyperfiltration, the setting of a significant degree of chronicity in kidney biopsy uh, would have uh, particularly more benefit in terms of a proteinuria reduction, but we did not find uh, significant differences uh, in this regard. But uh, we should also take into account that uh, for some patients, the kidney biopsy was done uh, some years before. So it was not a, you know, a, a, a good um, uh, information uh, to evaluate the effects of, uh, of the agent because of the, the differences between the kidney biopsy and the, the, the initiation of, of the agent. Yeah. I have one additional question. Are there immunosuppressive agents or combinations of agents where you would decide against SGLT2 inhibitors, particularly out of concern, surely, of infection complications like urinary tract infection, genital mycotic infections? Uh, or would you go for SGLT2 inhibitors independent of the immunosuppressive medication as long as you consider the patient to be in a kind of chronic phase? Yeah, well, um, you know, before um, we had uh, experience with a GLC2 inhibitor, um, uh, I include myself, I was a little bit, um, uh, uh, I you know, when, when I, I remember prescribing uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in kidney transplant population, I was a little bit worried that they would uh, develop uh, uh, particularly urinary tract infections. But, uh, you know, uh, from a clinical experience, uh, these drugs are uh, really safe, even in female patients with chronic kidney disease with uh, um, kidney transplantation being on maintenance immunosuppression. And uh, uh, the only important thing is to, to uh, remember the patient that it is necessary to uh, be a little bit caution with uh, this, uh, the, the development of uh, infections to, to, you know, to have uh, a good, um, some uh, like, like a little bit measures uh, to prevent uh, infections. Uh, but overall, uh, they do not seem to increase uh, uh, the risk uh, in those patients who are under immunosuppression uh, compared to those uh, that are without immunosuppression. Do you specifically counsel your patient that they should, you know, improve or at least, you know, um, continue genital hygiene in a way where would you consider, you know, infections to be prevented yeah particularly in male patients uh, it is necessary to to make them uh, more aware that uh, you know these little drops of urine can lead to uh, if, uh, fungal infections and therefore it is necessary that they uh, have this uh, precaution uh, in terms of the hygiene after going to the bathroom and uh, yeah I have one final question. So looking into the future, and you have mentioned already endothelin um, antagonism, um, and we saw a lot of sparse sentence data at the ASN Kidney Week. Mm -hmm. So 
where do you see the value then once sparsentan is hitting the market do we then treat the patient with ras inhibition sgt2 inhibition and then of, on top of that also with sparsentan or also for instance cipotentan in future yeah uh, i just wanted to say we are somehow living exciting times in nephrology uh, in terms of the new therapeutic alternatives. And uh, in my opinion, uh, HGLT2 have, will become uh, 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 one of the main uh, important, uh, important steps in the supportive care. And probably the combination of these different agents uh, will have synergistic effects. Uh, for instance, these uh, diuretic effects of SGLT2 inhibitors combined with sparsentan uh, could also help uh, in uh, uh, managing these other adverse events, for instance, uh, the development of edema, of lower limb edema. And uh, so, uh, my opinion, they will become, uh, and probably in the future, we will all, uh, also have the opportunity to have a combined pills also uh, to have these synergistic effects. Yes, I, I completely agree, Fernando. Uh, the, I think the big question is that Esparsentan is a new um, anti-hyperfiltration drug, drug, a new, new uh, anti-hyperfiltration drug. It would be a very good news that we have more drugs uh, to avoid uh, this kind of damage. But the question is uh, if, like author of the public of the paper said, that the um, Sparsentan have an podocyte effect and maybe uh, can induce an additional effect um, besides hyperfiltration. Maybe the curve of decrease uh, in proteinuria that the, the biggest decrease occurred in, in the, uh, at the beginning, uh, at the four week, in, induced to think that maybe the Fed is, a main, is again only hemodynamic and not uh, have other effect uh, on the podocyte. But we have to explore if, if Spacentan include a new effect, not only hemodynamic uh, effect. So I completely agree, Fernande. Fernando, new uh, times uh, for the nephrologist is coming, and maybe not only Spacentan, but the new uh, um, M -M -M NRI is coming. So uh, we, uh, we every time have more uh, tools uh, to use to avoid uh, the renal progression. And, uh, this is a very good news uh, for uh, all of us. I guess that's a perfect last word, actually. So good times for nephrology ahead of us. Thanks so much for meeting us tonight, but surely much more thank you for collecting all this data, for reporting this data. We are aware of the great clinical and academic work you do in Spain in the field of GN, even though you have been our first guest from Spain, actually, but surely we come back to you in the future. Thanks so much. Have a nice evening in Madrid. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a great opportunity. See you soon. Bye-bye.